Welcome, everybody. Um, nice to see you on an almost spring-like day today. And thanks for coming. Um, I am very happy to have the chance to introduce Dr. Oscar Morales. Uh, as I think most of you know, he's the medical director of McLean's TMS service. Uh, McLean's TMS service is the first in the Harvard's, uh, Harvard Partners Healthcare System um, that is dedicated to psychiatric treatments and investigation. And Dr. Morales is responsible for all TMS activities, including clinical training and current investigation of TMS in treating psychiatric disorders. He is on the faculty of the MGH McLean Adult Psychiatry Residency Training Program, and he's involved in the training of all Harvard students, residents, fellows, and psychiatrists in TMS. And as a fellow, Dr. Morales participated in the investigation that actually led the FDA to approve TMS for the treatment of depression in 2008, and he was the primary investigator for a worldwide trial that resulted in FDA approval of deep TMS for the treatment of depression in 2013. He's an expert in the National Network of Depression Centers, uh, TMS Task Group, and uh, that group develops guidelines, recommendations, and collaborative research at a national level. We're so proud to have the service that we have here at McLean Hospital and to have the opportunity to serve um, so many patients and to have the um, a treatment that is expanding in terms of uh, its application for patients. And um, Dr. Morales has been a, a real leader, and we're very happy that he is here to provide this Grand Rounds today. So thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Greenfield. It's a special pleasure to be here. In fact, it's an honor to to talk to you, but most important than that, working together has been a pleasure. It's been a number of years. Uh, many of you and I interact in different ways. Some of them I know directly, some of them, some of you less, but it's been always a special opportunity to develop uh, this project together. Uh, today, it's a beautiful day, so I think that TMS is lucky because we enjoy good weather too. And I would like to start this conversation telling you that uh, um, we, I work occasionally with, for one of the companies developing one of the devices. And I also had the opportunity to develop an idea with McLean about an invention and um, that is my disclosure of conflict of interest at this time. And first, I would like to tell you about today's conversation. So, and I would like you and I to focus on what is this thing? Why do we use it? How do we do TMS? and who really benefits from this type of intervention. And you will see that the questions that you see there are something we deal with every single day. So we treat patients that may come to see us from different areas in the hospital, from different areas in the state, and some of them may come far away, from far away. It's, uh, but the conversation always is about the same. And you're not the exception. I would like to share this with you. And I also would like you to see this as a conversation. So you need to ask questions. Please feel free to do so, do so anytime. At the end of this talk, we'll have a time for, for questions. But I really feel comfortable if you feel comfortable interrupting and asking questions. Nothing better than really addressing those aspects of the talk that you are interested in. So first, I would like to tell you that this has been a, an incredible journey. Uh, an incredible journey for McLean, for all our colleagues, but especially for patients. 
Um, and I would like you to see us, McLean TMS, as a very limited, small representation of what is happening all across the country. But this is what we are at this time regarding TMS. We started back in 2009, treatment number one, and at this time we project that we will be treating 20 plus patients daily. So back then in 2009, everyone paid for this. Self-pay was the rule, and from the very beginning, because of the strengths of this hospital, we were successful. So zero cover by insurance companies, McLean TMS was successful with treatments and patients that you send us and that we, and that we had the opportunity uh, working together. However, we knew that our mission was uh, bigger than that. So we were very interested, very invested from the very beginning in uh, making certain that TMS was an option for everyone. And then I have to tell you with a lot of happiness, I'm pleased telling you that there is universal cover for TMS at this time. And uh, at some point, not today because we don't have the time, and you will learn how McLean play such an important role in this achievement. Some of, the, of you I know know because we've been working together but some of them may be a little bit less familiar. But it is a fact, really, McLean played a vital role in this process. We were not the only ones, but an important player. Um, initially, back in 2009, so we had about one hour dedicated for TMS. That's all we had initially. It grew up very rapidly. Now we are actively treating patients almost 10 hours daily, starting at about 7.30, 8 in the morning, and finishing at about 5 p.m. in the afternoon. It's, uh, it's an incredible achievement for this hospital. Uh, and as you, some of you may know, the support that our patients and divisions had from all areas was incredible. I would say we had a superb support all the time. And um, regarding treatments, and now this will give you a sense of where we are. So initially we treated estimated 30 to 60, we delivered 30 to 60 treatments per month. We are projecting that we will be treat, uh, delivering about 400 treatments monthly at this time. And uh, in it, we started with one device. At this time, we have three TMS devices. What is possibly regarding patients uh, remarkable, it's, it's an incredible, remarkable uh, opportunity telling you that after thousands and thousands and thousands of treatments, there has been one complication. And that is uh, in some way expected. Obviously, we don't want it, but uh, the rates are probably below what is, has been described as the expected complication rates. Every single time from the very beginning, this was in our minds. So when you and I treat patients, when anyone, in fact, any division, any hospital, any specialty in psychiatry or in medicine, it's, it's not psychiatry, this is, we always think about what we can do to trigger some good response, and we always do, we must do every single thing we can possibly can to pr avoid harming interventions or harmful interventions. Therefore, every treatment that we deliver, I'm talking about medicine, should be preceded by careful assessment of risks, burdens, 
in comparison to all the good benefits or effectiveness that treatments may potentially have. Um, so medicine really has a solid, universal, tested principles. And first, do no harm has been there all the time and is going to be there forever because that is what we are for. Attempting to do the best that we can regarding effectiveness of treatments, minimizing risk. And TMS really meets all the criteria and, and many other times probably surpasses expectations regarding these uh, basic principles. There is a little bit of history that we will see gradually in different slides, but I would like to start telling you that and I need to look at that uh, screen for the following reason. It, uh, here the numbers are a little bit blurry and you can see here that in 1940 we started with ECT and then it was gradually growing in use. But one of the reasons why I wanted to show you this is because if you look at this 1940 and 1970, we are talking about 30 years gap. APA said nothing for 30 years. Uh, why was that? Uh, I don't know. But there might be obviously good reason for that. But uh, it's, uh, we all, and, and I assure you that nothing, this will not happen with any other intervention in psychiatry. But happened in the past. So the other reason for showing this is that 1985 was the first time that TMS was used in a human. It happened in London. And uh, as you can imagine, it was just uh, the first time that anyone placed a coil on the patient's head and attempted to do something in a human being when alert, awake. So it's, uh, since then, things started changing very rapidly. Uh, we'll see a little bit more of this, uh, the information that you see here. But in 2008, FDA approved first time uh, TMS for the treatment of depression. We'll see more, so don't worry if you don't, cannot see that very well. But here we have another slide showing you similar information, for instance, um, in 1985, it was the first time that the National Institutes of Mental Health said something about ECT. So we started using ECT in 1940, and NIMH started saying something in 1985. It's incredible, is that right? But that is, those are the facts. By coincidence, same year, Barker in London found that you can use TMS in a human being. Uh, later in 1990, APA had, again got together and said something about treatment interventions. But this is like possibly is a little bit more remarkable because in 1993 was the first time ever that any psychiatrist or physician started using TMS for the treatment of depression and that this happened in Germany. And uh, the case was interesting because they treated two very bad, severe acute cases of depression. As you can imagine, TMS was very in early phases of understanding of development. So the patient really didn't get any better. But what was remarkable was the effort, maybe we can do something with this. The rest of the information that you see here is, was brought to you because I would like you to focus on 2011. 2011 is when Medicare approved the use of TMS cover TMS for the treatment of depression ever. So, and since then, Medicare uh, area, regions in the country rapidly approved TMS and insurance companies follow. 
So it's estimated that more than 100 130 million population is actually covered uh, in the United States. And um, because we knew that in 2008, FDA approved treatment number one, uh, device number one, expecting a second device, it was just a matter of years. And then that happened in 2015. But at this time, I have to tell you that there are more devices that FDA has approved, which makes things more exciting and more options are given to patients. So this is live, maybe you have seen it before. So when we think about TMS, we think about what we do to the brain. And there are other interventions that potentially may be used or that can be used or that we can combine so obviously you have, we have an ECT that has been in use for many years. It's mostly, mainly treated for, the, for mood disorders. Other conditions are treated too, and it uses electricity. Potential side effects are cognitive <laughs> impairments. And uh, MST is really similar to ECT, and it is still in phases of development. But TMS is definitely already here. It was initially used as a neurophysiological tool. So for many years, there was investigation until the point when TMS was investigated and then approved for, the, for, for treatment of patients suffering from what we call now depression. The, obviously, the major difference is in between electrical intervention and magnetic intervention, as you will see, is the ability to trigger some excitation or inhibition in the brain while the patient is fully awake and alert without the necessity of any other added anesthetics or medications. DBS is in research and has been already approved for OCD and uh, Parkinson's tremor. Very invasive. Some patients may, need, may still need it. And then uh, it's important because it has given also a new perspective of some of the problems we deal with and uh, how invasiveness sometimes can give us also better understanding of how the brain works. So where are we at this time regarding the law? Remember, at the end, it's incredible, but every single thing we do has something to do with the law. So where is uh, ECT regarding the law? Well, it has been approved for the treatment of depression, and it is still in conversations at FDA level about uh, what other conditions may potentially be approved for and some other uh, aspects of potential complications. But TMS was initially approved as peripheral nerve stimulation, so it, it, it was an incredible nice tool that it was rapidly adopted by neurophysiologists, neurologists, and at some point neurosurgeons, neurosurgeons because you can see in the second line that has already been approved for cortical mapping. So in other words, it's not that we use it. Many others are using TMS with, for other reasons. And certainly 2008 was FDA approved for the treatment of depression. DBS, again, it has been approved for Parkinson's and is remarkable. I don't know if you've ever had any opportunity to see someone treated with DBS for Parkinson's. It's, it's, very, it's a very effective type of, very invasive, but very effective. VNS is a sad story, and I'm not going to spend any time at this. It's still in use, but all the data didn't match exactly about what really happens in the clinical settings. The use had been very limited at this time. More research needs to be done. So at this time, FDA really regulates devices, and there's a very nice, I think, uh, structured way of regulating any device that it's, uh, or that may potentially be used in the, uh, in the country. But anything we do with TMS has something to do with this. Remember that all our patients have the condition that we treat have different components. So there are many psychosocial components. There are many psychological components. There are 
medical components, behavioral components, and certainly we attempt to see some, some most of the uh, problem with depression from the brain point of view because TMS targets exactly that. But sometimes there is this belief that TMS is a very complex, sophisticated, mysterious type of intervention. I would like to tell you that it's possibly the opposite. TMS is a relatively simple technology. TMS uses magnetic field technology. If you think about psychotherapies, the main basic science behind it is psychology. So you think about medication that we use, the main science behind it is chemistry, biochemistry. So now it's some biology too, of course. But in the case of TMS, the main uh, use, the main science behind it is physics. And we use magnetic field technology that has been developed for different purposes and in this particular purpose for investigation of the brain and treatments. This slide in some ways summarizes everything. If you look at this slide, you will see everything that is involved with TMS. So you have a coil. A coil is a relatively simple piece of component of the TMS system. This, as you can imagine, is attached to a device. But the purpose is to deliver electricity to this metal piece coil in a way that electronically controlled electricity will be switched off and on thousands and thousands of times per millisecond. And by doing that, a magnetic field that you see here in red is generated. And then you also, we also have the target structure. So we have a coil, a magnetic field, and the structure that we would like to target in the brain. That's basically what TMS research or treatment involves. So what is the relationship between MRI and TMS? Well, they, just, they both use magnetic field technology. Similar, different. Similar from the point of view that if you look at the power of Tesla, Tesla power, they are not that different. So when you go or our patients go to MRI, they are exposed to similar strength of the, uh, of the magnetic field. And, uh, but the second box rate of change of the magnetic field makes a huge difference. Because if you see MRI, it's only 20 tesla per second, and then in the other, it changes dramatically. Therefore, when we deliver a treatment to a patient, the patient receives strong magnetic focus concentrated energy in a very limited cortical area. And uh, MRI induces no current in the brain. TMS induces current, that's the purpose. The uh, main idea with TMS is going through layers in the brain, in, in the head really, skin, muscles, soft tissue, skull, to the brain. But the purpose at the end is inducing a stimulation with electricity. So the magnetic field will translate into electrical fields. All that sounds very interesting and nice. Uh, does it really have anything to do with this thing we call the brain? And then is when the challenges and problems arise. So, it is estimated that the human brain is made of about 100 billion neurons and more than 100 trillion synapses. How can we possibly control that? How can we possibly really intervene effectively? And for many decades, we thought that we could. So with all intervention that we had, we been but the more we know, the more obvious is that we have very, a lot of limitations. And the more we know, the less we know, or at least the more aware we are, we are about how little we know. 
But at this time, and we will not talk about this because, you know, we will have a very limited time, but uh, this is nice for me to tell you that after decades of, of neuroscience research, and to the best that we can do in 2017, so we think that psychiatric disorders, you know, all of them, some of them, maybe disorders that will be classified, understood, and investigated as a human connecton disorder. If that is accurate, and remember the science also changes. So it's, uh, I have a small book of uh, therapeutics that was published at the end of the 18th century, early 19th century. And now we look at that information and we said, well, how can we possibly work <laughs> doing that? Uh, about treatments of everything, you know, it's small. It's, it's like a small Bible, I guess. And everything was contained there. So maybe in 10, 20, 40 years, you will say, how can we possibly deliver TMS for, for depression that way? But that's what we, the best that we can do at this time. Therefore, hopefully, the human connectome concept and investigation will help us be more precise regarding interventions in our understanding of how the brain works. But many things have happened for decades. For decades and there have been many people thinking that perhaps looking at the brain and how the brain works, how neuropathology in the brain affects behaviors and, and, and especially depression. And I brought you this because maybe you are, you are familiar with some of these names in the references. But they, they have been talking about this for some time, thinking about specific structures in the brain that may have something to do with depression. Uh, remember that at this point, we think that depression has something to do with circuit systems that we have uh, given a name of a limbic system, complex system, of course. So what does all that to do with depression in the first place. All of that sounds interesting and for some maybe exciting, but what, what is the story with what we do on a daily basis? So depression is a problem. In fact, the majority of patients cannot be treated well. So the majority of them don't, can't receive adequate treatments for different reasons. You see some of them here, so some of them some of the treatment we have don't work simply uh, as that. In fact, some people are starting to suggest that medications that have been antidepressants that we have been using for a long time may not be antidepressants at all. So it's surprising, but I like it because it forces us to review what we are doing. Uh, many people and patients don't tolerate medications. There are many conditions, and I would like to stress this. Because when we treat patients, they suffer from depression and many other conditions at the same time. So our patients suffer from depression and you can name it comorbid psychiatric conditions. But making things more complicated, they suffer from depression, maybe some other psychiatric comorbidities and medical comorbidities. So they have heart conditions, brain conditions, neurological conditions, metabolic conditions. How do we deal with all of that at the same time while attempting to trigger a good response, minimizing side effects? And that was it's incredible, but TMS has given us the opportunity to intervene, attempting to reduce or to trigger some reduction in symptoms. So this is a common scenario in psychiatry. We are in difficulties when we deal with patients that don't respond well to standard treatments. The consequences, you are experts, so I don't have to tell you about that too much. But you know that the consequences of no treatment or inadequate treatments are huge. From the financial point of view, from the medical point of view, from the personal point of view, we always try to focus when we treat patients in the patient itself, the person. And uh, it has many consequences. 
And, and then doing something or attempting to do something effectively while minimizing risk, hopefully, will give them some opportunity to get over about, uh, regarding some of those problems. So what was the interest in TMS and depression? So it, uh, again, many people have been working for years, since 1985. So there, has been observ there were many observations that mood changes in early brain mapping studies using TMS show that there might be something that can be targeted specifically with TMS. There has been also gradual and better understanding of how anatomy is one thing, function is another, and now things are more complicated because not only the function, but the function at what time. And you know, those who are experts in imaging here understand the complexity of now dealing with MRI was something that we really trusted. And then there are reports that there have been issues and we don't fully understand how, what we are looking at. Not to mention the actual functional connections that uh, might explain some behaviors. And certainly, knowledge about ECT was a plus. So learning about things that happened with ECT gave us a chance to start from some, somewhere, not from nothing. Um, and again, most of what we do attempt to focus on something like this. So we know the frontal lobes have something to do with the limbic system. The limbic system must be in some way affected by something that happened in the brain. And I have to be very vague because we are vague. I mean, it's not me. It's science. Sometimes patients come to see us, and they truly believe we know. So they come to see us because they suffer from depression, and they believe we know exactly what is the problem with depression. And I have to tell them, listen, we know a little, but there are so many things we don't know. But hopefully, this is right. So we have a mood system in the brain that seems to work very nicely, well-tuned, finally working. Suddenly, dysfunction happens for some reason, and we hope that by interve focal intervention may correct some of it. And uh, it's not only an idea anymore. So this, what you see here is a summary of PET studies. PET has been still considered one of the very nice tools for understanding how the brain works. It's very specific, very invasive. And this set of studies summarize here that there are Definitely, there are areas in people suffering from depression. There are areas that we can identify where in the brain is the depression condition lies. Still a mystery, but it's gradually becoming a little bit clear that we can identify structures and functions in the specific areas. And one of them is what you see here. If you look at the cingulate cortex, and you correlate cingulate cortex in depression and then singulate cortex activity in treatments with medications, therapies, ECT. All of them have something to do with singulate cortex. It's not the only one, but it's big. It's a big structure and it's connected to other areas of the limbic system. So it's nice to have a criminal there that we can target. And this is an old device. And I show you this because that is the essence and the basics. There are many new devices. Uh, devices are like cars. I always tell people that we work with different brands, colors, features, but the basics remain the same. So we have a capacitors of electricity and electronic system controlling how electricity is delivered to this coil, and then the coil generating a magnetic field. And all that remains true for every, any device we have at this time. So different image, same basics. So you have here a coil affecting the uh, areas that we think has something to do with a function that we are looking or thinking. And then at the end, what we are delivering is a stimulation with magnetic field, 
electricity that will depolarize neurons. And what makes our TMS unique is what you have here. Because we have to treat a patient who is fully awake, fully alert, and we have to go through layers, skin, soft tissue, muscles, and then the skull, two centimeters thickness. So having something that penetrates while the patient looks like you look now, awake, alert, calm, relatively comfortable, it's, it's incredible in medicine, not to mention in psychiatry. And, but the purpose is the polarization of neurons. And this is how we think now about TMS. We'll change, I have no doubts about it, but that's how we are thinking now. If it is true that the brain works through networks, if there are circuits, if there are interaction between different networks, so maybe by targeting an area, we can modulate deeper, far away networks that have something to do with depression. And, Lots of investigation. So I always tell patients and people we work with, we are fortunate. TMS didn't start as a treatment, treating patients. So treating patients really is the outcome on decades of investigation. So we are in great shape. It's not enough, of course, but it, it was a good way to start. So things have been changing since 1993. Uh, because in 1993, this is what happened. So first humans being, well, first people suffering from depression treated with TMS. And again, basics, but that gives you a visual appreciation of what happens when we treat patients. There is a device. Remember, this is only one of several devices but all of them will, at the end, deliver a magnetic field to the selected target structure in the brain. Um, what do we think is really happening in the, in the brain when we deliver a magnetic field? Uh, it's believed that the electricity really induces brain uh, change by depolarizing neurons. And then multiple neurobiological effects can be studied. We don't fully understand it. We don't have all the evidence showing in order to tell you all of this happens in this sequence. But we believe that this depolarization and uh, effects of the electricity in the brain that finally had some neurobiologic effect, such as uh, neuron growth factors uh, release or production which has been studied, of course. There are suggested mechanisms of action, but all of them at some point have something to do with depolarization. The settings and how we treat the patients are pure technical matters. They sound complicated, but they are not. It's just a matter of becoming familiar with them. So I don't want to spend too much time with the intensity, the frequency, hertz, uh, pulses that we use, but uh, I would like to tell you, like any other device, we can play with multiple variables, good and bad. Good because we can adjust, bad because many variables are a problem when you are trying to understand what really is happening. Uh, but now we understand that there is a long-term long -term activation or inhibition in the brain, depending on what kind of setting you use. And you can think about the effects in this way. So cortical excitability is critical for understanding TMS because we use the cortex reaction to TMS. And uh, the excitability in the cortex can be increased or decreased. So, and the evidence in animals is there. So it's not only in humans, but the we can do it. So when you think about medications that induce activation of the brain, for instance, anything that increases serotonin will trigger some reaction, some activation. Well, here you have a physical force doing the same. Or the opposite, sometimes we prescribe medication that will inhibit neuron function, for instance, GABAergic medications, 
or medications given anti-epileptic or anti-seizure medications. So it's possible to do the same. It's not only possible, it's now using by neurologists treating patients suffering from epilepsy. So in other words, when you, you and I and our patients think about TMS, we are targeting either activation or inhibition or sometimes both. Um, again, parameters matter, but obviously they are not the only component. So now we have the brain that we don't understand, as you know. And then it's not only that we don't understand the brain, but the brain changes very rapidly and get a, adjust to situations that we have no control. So experts in imaging used to do functional connectivity. At rest or inactive settings. And that, that apparently was a nice paradigm is already changing because the brain seems to beat us all the time when we try to do something. Um, and there's a lot of effort, definitely, in TMS and imaging. Why is that? Because both are non-invasive modalities of intervention to the brain. So having two nice modalities for testing the brain is terrific. And I always tell others, we had two great modalities of non, non or least intervention regarding the brains, psychotherapies and TMS for purposes of intervention. And just to give you a sense how things change. So this is just number of pulses that were given, delivered initially, and this is changing. So it was believed by back in the uh, late 19s that giving too much magnetic energy could kill a person. So, and scientists were very cautious, moving slowly, gradually. And you see that huge difference between the strength of the treatments then and now. And uh, it's not only the strength of the treatments and pulses, uh, but other studies have been studied and will be studied again. This slide is pure technical description of a possibilities. But for treatment of someone from suffering from depression, you will get this. The machine is active for a few seconds and there is silence. Active machine, silence. Active machine. And that repeats and repeats for a number of minutes. In our scenario, it's 20 minutes. And the purpose of this slide is showing you what is the electrical field that you trigger with TMS versus the electrical field that you trigger with ECT. The difference is huge. So it's, and that is the reason why we have to deal with benefits and issues with one and the other. And uh, this, you know, but I also wanted to stress the fact that uh, TMS obviously not, is not inducing seizure. We don't want to. Would be a complication. It's not we don't require any medications. Enrichers deeper structures in the brain. Here we say no. Things are changing. Maybe yes. And that is another change in technology because normally TMS was delivered. We consider TMS as a cortical stimulation affecting about three cubic centimeters volume in the cortex. It's, uh, some research is suggesting that maybe we can affect 17 cubic centimeters. And there's a lot of controversy. But if that proves to be correct, we are close to changing the way how we deal with the brain and how we understand reactions in the brain and how we treat patients. Um, I would like to move quickly because I would like to really spend a little bit of time discussing some questions with you. But this is a, a standard way of treating the patient. This is how they should look. This is how the device may look, and this is what we use for uh, treatments. You see me here sitting. There is a helmet. Remember that the coils are technologies that change and are not the same for every device. So this is one device of many or several. Why do we think about the motor strip? The motor strip for us is key because the motor strip 
give us a sense of what is the dosage that patient will receive. We test TMS excitability in the motor strip, and after measuring something called motor threshold measurements, we make calculations of the dosage that patients may need. So in other words, TMS magnetic field is given based on patient's individual reaction to TMS in the brain. Um, standard medical workup, and I have to tell you that the other reason that you all should know why we, I think we are successful is because all our patients are in interaction with psychiatrists and our staff, medical teams, neurological teams, and working together has given us incredible ability to treat them safely. There are contraindications, especially metal, metal devices in the head. And uh, seizure has been always a problem, has potential complications. And after thousands of treatments here in this hospital, we have one episode of a cortical, self-limited uh, seizure, that it was mostly motor expression of a cortical seizure. The patient never lost consciousness. She had just motor uh, movements in hands, arm, chest, shoulder. She fully recovered after a few seconds, but you know, we don't want it. It's believed that that reaction is probably, the rate is low in comparison to antidepressant medication. So if someone takes medications, the rate of seizure may be a little bit higher. Um, let me move to this. McLean also play, play, in my view, an important role. So it's not that we wanted to treat many patients, opening that opportunity, but we wanted to advance the possibilities with TMS. And we were involved in a multi-center trial with a group of institutions that are involved in research. And this uh, multi-center research trial led FDA to approve TMS for the treatment of, uh, deep TMS for the treatment of depression. So you see all the institutions that were involved and um, the adverse effect were something like this. And this really reflects what happened when we treat patients. What do they complain about? They may have eye pain, sometimes toothaches. Uh, most common side effect is really headaches, mild headaches. It's easy to treat with Tylenol or Motrin. What do we tell patients? How do we share TMS with them? This is what we normally tell them. So this is non-invasive. This is, uh, we don't use anesthetics on medications. Zero memory issues consistently. Research has shown that you can treat patients weeks and weeks and months, zero memory deficits. At least 20 treatments, almost all of them receive much more than that. But more important also is function. Before the treatment, nothing is restricted, and after treatment, nothing is restricted. And I would like to quickly move to this. Why do I, am I showing you this map? Because I would like to tell you that we don't work alone. McLean is, in my mind, powerful by itself, but knows how to share and work together locally and all across the country. So we do it. And all those institutions are actually working together. And the point is maybe we together may, might make things happening that cannot be, can't happen individually. And one of them is definitely one concrete achievement of those institutions was the development of guidelines as approved by APA for the treatment of depression. Those guidelines were, uh, and, and I'm not going to tell you about that, but I have a PDF document that I will make certain that everyone have access to. Because in the first place, it's a nice educational tool. Secondly, tells the public, the medical field, what to do and how we recommend the treatment at this time. A group of people involved, of course, and uh, different scenarios, but oops, so for 
Let's see if I can't. So in my mind, the reason why this consensus became much more important than just the medical explanation and recommendation was that was the first official way of recognizing that now we have something new, something that is there for patients and something that we can share and hopefully be effective and get involved in development too. And I would like to stop here in case that there is a question from your end. Uh, she will be giving you a microphone, please. Can you uh, comment on the efficacy of the treatment? Does it, uh, what percentage of patients who appear for treatment uh, yes. have recovery, and what's the duration? Right, absolutely. So if we use the standard randomized controlled trials, sham controlled trials, it's one superior to placebo. Two important studies have shown that, is the, that the effect in comparison to placebo is better than medications. But medications have a low response rate in comparison to placebo. So we are unhappy with that. So because we all are sharing the same problems. But at least we will give you a sense that in comparison with antidepressants, TMS is there or a little bit higher. That is randomized controlled trials. In clinical settings, it's different. I hope different better. But randomized controlled trials means the patient will be treated with TMS only versus sham. Clinical settings are different. Our patients are taking medications, antidepressants, other medications. They are involved in psychotherapies. Sometimes they are in programs. And we add TMS. Therefore, when you and I think about TMS, we must think about augmentation strategies. Similar to ECT. ECT patients never stop medications. They never stop psychotherapies. They continue doing everything while we give them ECT. Same thing here. Why do we have to do all this at the same time? Why do we have to give them medications, psychotherapies, uh, programs, and TMS? And the answer is our lack of knowledge about how to do it directly, effectively. We don't fully understand depression. Therefore, we do everything we think will give patients better chances to succeed. And therefore, in clinical populations, the rate goes higher. So of all patients that we treat, we believe it, or we have the information about 25% at least of the patients have full remission. 25% of the patients have response, which means at least 50% reduction in symptoms. And 25% have less than 50% reduction by some degree of response. That gives you a sense of 75% of the patients having from some to more to more to remission. It's incredibly nice because we start with treatment-resistant depression conditions, patients that have been treated with multiple medications, not for one week, not for one month, but many of, some, many of them for years. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, and I just want to say that you've always been incredibly generous in, in, in having visitors who are interested in, 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 in uh, viewing it, so I would extend that. Um, one question is about the cost. And, and uh, if you could say something about sort of an individual cost, but also given that it's a series, how that adds up. And the other is, do you foresee at some point, given how uh, some people really don't like medications per se, and, and some medications are, are difficult to tolerate, do you foresee that at some point TMS might become a first-line treatment? Well, you know, it's a great question. First, let me start by the second question. So it would be nice to have one thing treating depression. I don't see it, not because TMS may not be potentially more effective, but because we don't, we don't understand depression. And it's unlikely that we will have one single thing that targets everything. It's complex. 
I think that maybe you and I and all of us will end our careers with the concept that depression is not one thing, it's many things. And we put them all together, you know, we put all the symptoms, everything, behaviors together, put them in a bag, and we said, this is depression. And that's the best that we can do until we have better science telling us, listen, this is different types of depression. Now let's go and use medication A or therapy A or TMS or maybe all of them together. Yes, unlikely. Possible, unlikely. Regarding the, the cost, it's uh, almost all insurance companies in Massachusetts cover, which means no burden, no extra burden for the patients. But if they have to pay for this, in this hospital is about $8,000 per course of treatment, which is six, seven weeks of treatments. Is that expensive or cheap? It depends. <laughs> if you have a, a stent place in 40 minutes, it's about $25,000. So I tell our patient, listen, we should do more, we should do more. Maybe we should not charge you more, but we should do more. It is a relatively cheap intervention when you think in other medical interventions that are much more expensive. Yes. Uh, what's been your experience to date in more complex patients with comorbid PTSD and anxiety? Yes, we, I, I, thank you for asking because at this point in time, we don't treat anything else but depression. But comorbidity is there in many of them. Therefore, do we expect patients with depression having comorbid PTSD? Many of them do. Do depression may coexist with comorbid anxiety disorder? Definitely, yes. Therefore, we don't treat other conditions, but we hope that if we treat successfully depression symptoms, other symptoms hopefully will become a little bit more sensitive to standard care, therapies, medications, and other treatments that we have available. So it um, has to be tested too. It would be nice at some point to have a, a randomized controlled trial testing that idea, but that's what we do. But we are not the only ones. Everyone is doing the same with medication, with therapies, and with uh, ECT too. If someone suffers depression and PTSD, we never say, listen, we are not going to give you ECT. The opposite, we said, let's do it. Same thing happened with TMS, I guess. It's after one, so I don't know if you're available to catch up with people after the talk, Dr. Morales. All right, well, let's say thank you.